our work done with, the year 1920 finds Franklin D. Roosevelt at the threshold of a new career. He began to take a prominent place in councils of his party. His keen-minded and progressive thought were eagerly sought on state and national affairs. When the Democrats gathered in San Francisco in July 1920 for their national convention, Roosevelt's name was on many tongues. It was inevitable that he should be nominated for vice president to run with James M. Cox. Enthusiastically, he stumped the country, preaching the ideals of Woodrow Wilson and rallying the party to the support of the ticket. Wherever he spoke, his vibrant personality and flashing smile made new friends. There was a ring of sincerity in his voice that the people liked and which they never forgot. Loyally and energetically, he fought the stern battle for his chief and for the party. With James M. Cox, he looked on with kindling eyes while San Francisco turned out a great parade in their honor. These were stirring hours in the life of our president, where he was getting his first lessons in the art of national campaigning. He loved the gay clamor of the political battle as he loves it now. He responded to every stirring phase of the exciting, moving panorama of political life. These marching people were not merely voters to Franklin Roosevelt, they were human beings. And to their greeting, he responded with his gay and gallant humanity. But his thoughts were back home in beautiful Hyde Park, with Mrs. Roosevelt and their four children and very little folks they were in those days, and with his favorite dog. His thoughts went back to the wife, who'd been his boyhood sweetheart, and always his loyal helper. But the campaigning had to go on, even though he felt the cause was lost. In speech after speech, with the extraordinary energy, which is even now the amazement of the nation, he sought to rally the discouraged democracy. Wherever he appeared, his warm personality and friendliness caught the crowd. People surged about him, and when the campaign came to its close, there was the same eager desire on the part of the public to get a close-up of this new young champion of democratic principles, this young man in politics who had proved himself by good work. And then it was back home in earnest to be greeted at his door by his adoring mother, to speak to old friends and neighbors in simple, friendly words of greeting and welcome. and to shake hands with folks who came from miles around to greet neighbor Frank. Then came an interval of political quiet spent with Mrs. Roosevelt and with their four youngsters. And then the great political battle of 1924 where with Alfred E. Smith and John W. Davis, he stood out as a leader. There never was a political convention to match the Democratic National Gathering of 1924 in New York for drama and color and bitterness. McAdoo against Al Smith, day after day of fruitless balloting, terrific storms of passion shaking the delegates and convulsing the thousands in the gallery. The high note of all, Franklin D. Roosevelt's presentation of the name of Alfred E. Smith, and the deathless phrase, the happy warrior. Democratic convention at Houston in the Lone Star State, and once more Franklin D. Roosevelt took the stage to praise as only he could do, the man for whom he has always had such affection and respect, naming him again, the happy warrior, his friend, Alfred E. Smith, the governor of New York. Al Smith, who will always have his own place in the hearts of the American people. But events were moving fast. Al Smith as candidate for president in 1928, wanted a good man to run for governor of New York. He persuaded Franklin Roosevelt to make the race. And although Mr. Smith lost the state by a narrow vote, Franklin Roosevelt was elected to his first term as governor. And we see him in his new high office for the first time. And as he participates with Mrs. Lehman at the inaugural ball, at that very moment, an even greater honor was looming in the near distance. But he himself, engrossed by his duties as governor of the Empire State, was content to do the work in hand. Occasionally, he took time off to attend public gatherings, such as the State Fair at Syracuse, driving there with his mother, Mrs. Sarah Delano Roosevelt. 
And in his democratic fashion, he took his lunch in the outdoor restaurant with an appetite sharpened by his holiday away from the rigors of office. His relaxation and exercise was swimming, then as now. A swimming pool was installed in an old greenhouse attached to the executive mansion. And there the governor would spend as much time as he could take from his official duties and healthful recreation and having a grand time, skylarking in the water. Today, by the way, he's one of the most powerful swimmers in the country. Few can match him at backstroke and leg drag. And it's heartening to know that a fine swimming pool is now being installed for him in the basement of the White House. He can continue to get the exercise he needs to enable him to face his great tasks. But to go back to his rule in New York, there were tense, trying days. The famous Seabury inquiry was probing the government of the city. Samuel Seabury, whom we see arriving at the county courthouse in New York, was getting closer to the mayor of the city, Jimmy Walker. It's Jimmy Walker, slim, smiling, and sprightly, that we see following Judge Seabury into the courthouse and it became Governor Roosevelt's stern duty eventually to try Mayor Walker on the charges Seabury submitted. A variety of official duties constantly made demands on his energy. Personally, he presided in 1931 at the dedication of the Great Washington Bridge over the Hudson. In the presence of a great crowd on this magnificent bridge, Governor Roosevelt cut the tape which opened the bridge to traffic between New York and New Jersey. And then came the even more tempestuous months in 1932, when the Bonus Expeditionary Army invaded Washington. It was a curious situation, because the country had a friendly and sympathetic feeling for the veterans. But when their massed forces settled down to stay, until Congress gave them the cash bonus, the government finally came to the decision that it had to take strong measures. Sad, pathetic episode in our current history. But the assembling of the Democratic Convention in 1932 in Chicago drove almost all other topics out of the minds of the people. Already, Franklin D. Roosevelt was the favorite for the nomination. His leading opponent, by a strange travesty of fortune, was none other than his old friend, Alfred E. Smith. The keynote was sounded by Senator Barkley of Kentucky. In order, therefore, to obtain the present will of the American people on this subject of universal controversy, this convention should, in the platform here to be adopted, recommend the passage by Congress of a resolution repealing the 18th Amendment to the Constitution. But this question of prohibition had adherence on both sides. And meantime, the Dries were meeting in convention and just as vigorously upholding the noble experiment. Repeal swept the Democratic Convention, but the presidency was the real fight, and the break came when William Gibbs McAdoo went to the speaker's stand. When any man comes into this convention with 700 votes in it, he's entitled to the nomination. Franklin D. Roosevelt, having received more than two-thirds of all the delegates voting, I proclaim him the nominee of this convention for President of the United States. <laughs> Upon word of his nomination, Governor Roosevelt broke all precedents away he has by flying to Chicago. The country was thrilled to this news. There was a general sigh of relief when word came that the Roosevelt plane, after fighting through a storm, had landed safely at Chicago. And in a little while, the people heard the roar of cheers that greeted him at the convention hall and his own familiar voice in thanks to the delegates. You have nominated me, and I know it. And I am here to thank you for the honor. <laughs> Let
let it also be symbolic that in so doing, I broke tradition. I say to you now that from this date on, the 18th Amendment is doomed. I pledge myself to a new deal for the American people. And then the happy release from politics and official worries, back to his first love, the sea. Off with his tall sons on a cruise up the New England coast in a 22-foot yawl. Chief cook and bottle washer as well as admiral. Out into the warm summer sunshine and the health-giving ocean breeze. A prisoner of state no longer, but free and carefree. Just a citizen on vacation. And then as a man must, back to work and official responsibility, but relieved and refreshed by his swimming pool. And the good fun he has at swimming with his daughter, Mrs. Dahl, and his little grandchild. Only a few weeks more now before the hard grind of the presidential campaign. But he is fit and ready, ready to fight for the presidency. chieftain who has been WPA administrator in command of federal relief and he in turn has succeeded by he takes his oath of office which is administered by Supreme Court Justice Reed at the White House with President Roosevelt former administrator of the WPA he's Secretary of Commerce now his appointment still to be ratified by the Senate the Senate opens its session for the day with Vice President Garner presiding Congress, with an increased Republican opposition, faces a momentous series of political struggles. The administration leader is Senator Barkley of Kentucky on the left. Near him, Senators Harrison of Mississippi and McKellar of Tennessee. There are Senators Ashurst of Arizona. The Senate Commerce Committee is holding hearings on the appointment of the new Secretary of Commerce, Harry Hopkins there, stating his case. I have bought and sold millions and millions and millions of dollars worth of goods. I've negotiated with businessmen uh, for uh, in hundreds and thousands of transactions on behalf of the government. Then the former WPA administrator tells his attitude toward government and business. There is no conflict between business and government because there can be none. The conflict is between the interpretations of their relationships to each other. Government, by consent of the governed, must be concerned primarily with the welfare of the nation and all its people. It has no choice. Our system is so designed that if public officials do not show this concern, they will be replaced by officials who do. at war, spending as usual is as dangerous as business as usual. We can't have all we want for ourselves and at the same time give our fighting men all they must have. Everyone in this audience is as deeply involved in this war as our soldiers at the front and our sailors on the sea. We've got to think war and act war in our personal, everyday lives. There's no better way for civilians to get behind a war effort than to cut down spending, to save materials to buy war savings bonds. Nearly 10 million Americans are now buying war bonds, but with a war costing us $120 million every day, we've got to save and buy bonds on a vastly greater scale. 
we've got to step up the sale of war bonds to a billion dollars every month. Every community in this country will have to do its share to reach this quota. All of us who earn regular pay should set aside an average of at least 10% of it every week for buying war bonds. The most convenient way of doing this is through the payroll savings plan, under which you authorize your employer to set aside a part of your earnings every payday. So let's stop needless spending and start to save for victory. It's not only smart to be thrifty, but our future depends upon it. Remember, what you save now serves your country today and yourself tomorrow. It's time for us as individuals to make our own declaration of war against the Nazis and the Japanese. Let's do it now. War loan opening. Members of Congress, Secretary of the Treasury Morgenthau and Vice President Wallace. On the opening of the fourth war loan, they were asking the people of the United States to subscribe $14 billion. I'm very happy on the first day to be invited to come up to the Congress of the United States and to sell the first bond to you, Mr. Vice President. Thank you for this opportunity, Mr. Secretary. And I want to assure you that the congressmen of the United States, thinking of the welfare of their country, believe that the buying of bonds is second in importance only to the fighting at the front. The secretary sells bonds to the members of Congress, which starts a new flood of dollars to support our fighting forces and win the victory. And the boss of the United States Treasury counts the cash, the beginning of the 14 billion.
the hills of Vermont, the key of the greatest financial undertaking in the history of the world. Neighbors come to the home of Norman Rockwell to pose for posters for the second war bond drive. This one, freedom from want, first of America's basic four freedoms. Posing are great Americans, great in the simple fact that they are just folks. Freedom of speech, that America ever may keep the birthright of free speech. Freedom from fear, that America may never know at home the sadistic words blood purge and concentration camp. Fourth and not least, freedom of religion, that any American ever may worship God according to that American's belief. Whether it be the majestic service of the city's storied temple, or in the simple refreshment of bedtime prayer and praise. In Washington, the actual start of the campaign to raise $13 billion for the second war loan. Mr. President, the Treasury Department is offering the people of America an opportunity to lend their support to our fighting men in the Great Spring Offensives by subscribing $13 billion to the second war loan. Mr. Secretary, this is just a small cross-section of the White House staff, but we're like a great many other American houses throughout the country. Most of us have got some member of the family in the fighting forces of the United States, and we back home are trying to do our bit too. Yes, and out there, they are doing more than their bit. Your money must buy these bonds and shorten the war to help rebuild bodies torn by the war, to restore to health our boys fighting around the globe, to buy the most perfect fighting equipment. In the continental United States, rehabilitation. Your money will buy bonds to help make these shattered bodies whole again. To make certain that the men who walked in the valley of the shadow of death may be able to walk once again. that an injured spine may be restored. Your money to buy the bonds for hospitals for these boys. Across America, everyone signs up in the Army buying the second war bond. On top of the Continental Divide in Colorado, 12,000 feet above the sea. On a western ranch, the bonds find a ready sale. at the White House once again, and the inside story of the first sales of this new war loan. You turn that on, Captain, five. <laughs> Transaction is complete. <laughs> Number nine, and all right here, look, I'm a great salesman. I missed my trade. Can I have the money? Put out your money, too. All right. Fine. And I have that to Henry. That's it. Yeah, you get that. <laughs> That's all right. <laughs> all right, people, I'm going, look, look, we've got more here. That's all right. <laughs> Here's some more, Henry. All right, now let's go back here. <laughs> look at all these bars. That's a good job. <laughs> we subscribe, if I might paraphrase the slogan, of this new drive to maintain the war and turn out more things for our troops at the front. They give their lives, we lend our money. Yes, Americans, once again, it is up to you. It was an earnest and hard-working First Lady who visited our boys in the Southwest Pacific, as these pictures, just released by the Marine Corps, disclose. Informality is the keynote of Mrs. Roosevelt's chats with these wounded boys. Whenever possible, the President's wife made a point of greeting everyone individually. Now at the White House, Eleanor Roosevelt has a message for us at home. In a nation such as ours, every man who fights for us is in some way our man. His parents may be of any race or religion, 
But if that man dies, he dies side by side with all of his buddies. And if your heart is with any man, in some way it must be with all. All the men are our men, part of our United States, which they have saved, so that we can still call it the land of the free and the home of the brave. In sharp contrast to her serious home report, Mrs. Roosevelt greeted the boys out there with infectious good humor. For instance, a story about Guadalcanal and Mr. Roosevelt. Just as the Marines go out to leave Guadalcanal, an officer found a private feeling very sad, looking very depressed. And he said, what's the matter with you? And he said, oh, I just can't go on. I haven't shot a jack. <laughs> and so uh, the officer said, well, listen. I'll tell you what to do. You go up to that ridge over there and jump up all of a sudden and say, the hell with your ego. And they'll jump up other people all around, and if you shoot first, you'll get a jack. <laughs> so we came by a little while later, and the uh, ring was still looking very gloomy, and he said, did you do what I told you to do? And um, he said, yes, sir, yes. I ran up there, and I did just what you told me to do, and I said, to hell with your ego, you and they jumped up just as you told me they would, but they all shouted, to hell with Roosevelt. <laughs>